One of the ways in which we worshipfully respond to God is through singing. And for the month of May, we're looking at, at passages of Scripture that many biblical scholars believe are very early hymns or portions of very early hymns that were sung by the church, the earliest churches, and that Paul and the gospel writers and other New Testament writers weave into the biblical text to help tell the story of the gospel and to help call us to deeper and greater faith. Last week, we looked at a hymn in Philippians chapter 2 that honors and reveres Christ's self-emptying, Christ's obedience to God, even unto death, even death on the cross, a hymn that Paul cites to encourage the church, and that means you and me, a hymn that Paul quotes to encourage the church to be of the same mind, the same mind that was in Christ Jesus himself when he made that obedient, complete sacrifice. Today we turn to a very different hymn, one that celebrates God's faithfulness to God's people, generation to generation, a hymn that Luke attributes to Mary, the mother of Jesus, a hymn that we can trace back musically all the way back to the 6th century. So this isn't just a hymn that the church sang some 2,000 years ago. This is a hymn the church has been singing for some 2,000 years in one form or another. But it's a song we associate with and sing almost exclusively at Christmas time. Because in Luke's gospel, it is sung by a pregnant Mary as she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth after the archangel Gabriel has visited her and has told her that she will be the mother of the Messiah. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, I know you Americans still think it's cold out, but this is spring, this is Easter. Christ is risen. Yes. And of course, you're right. But we must also remember that everything written in the New Testament was written down by the light of the empty tomb. We understand Christmas and everything else by looking back through the lens of Easter. And so I think it's helpful for us to take the time from time to time to consider the Magnificat apart from, outside of the season of Christmas, because the glitz and the glitter of Christmas often distract us from or hold us back from confronting these prophetic words that Mary sings, and perhaps more to the point, they hold it. Christmas holds us back from allowing these prophetic words to confront us. Christmas also distracts us from Mary, as ironic as that may sound. Our focus at Christmas is, and rightly so, on Jesus, but Mary is an extraordinary figure in her own right. We wouldn't be telling the gospel story without her. And not just because she served as the vehicle, as the vessel through which Christ was born into our world. We wouldn't be telling the gospel story without her because she is the first person to believe in Jesus as the Savior, the Messiah sent by God. She is the first person to say yes to God because of Jesus. So, properly understood we really should consider Mary to be the first disciple. We might even go so far as to think of Mary as the archetype disciple that sets the standard, sets the model for all other disciples who come after her. Mary shows us and sings for us what believing in Jesus, what following Jesus, what giving ourselves over to Jesus is all about. 
And so this morning, I want us to walk through this hymn that we commonly call that Magnificat and take a look at Mary, both as a model for worship and as a model for discipleship as she sings her song. My soul magnifies the Lord. This is where the title for the hymn, the Magnificat, comes from. That's what the word Magnificat means in Latin, to magnify. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. It's important for us to remember as we sing this song, as we read through the words to this song, that this is a song of praise. It's prophetic, but it's a song of praise at its core, at its beginning, at its heart. I magnify the Lord. I exalt the Lord. I zoom in on the Lord. Not on myself, not on anything or anyone else. From the outset, what Mary is singing is about God, wholly and exclusively. And she is singing to God. She is praising God. She is magnifying God simply and solely because of who God is. Not for anything God has done or promised to do. We're going to get to that. But that's not where we start. We start with Mary praising God simply because of who God is, who she recognizes, how she who she recognizes and understands God to be. And that's where worship always truly begins, with nothing more and nothing less. My spirit rejoices in God because of who God is. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness, or your translation might say the humility of his servant. Honestly recognizing God for who God is comes with and coincides with an honest recognition of who we are in relation to this God. That's what the lowliness and humility is here. This is not Mary devaluing herself. She shouldn't do that, nor should we. But her worship is flowing out of her recognition of who God is, and that leads her to an understanding of who she is in a very complete and honest way. It leads her to declare that she needs saving. It also leads her to declare she is saved, that she is in need of love, that she is loved, that she is in need of embracing, and she is embraced. That's why we praise God. This honesty leads her then to begin to serve the purposes, the will of this saving, loving, embracing God. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. Now we get to the stuff that God has done, at least generally speaking. She reflects on the great things that God has done for her. She acknowledges it. She celebrates it. But then notice she restates that God is holy, that it is God who is holy, lest she fall into the trap of beginning to praise herself, of turning this song about God into a song about her, however indirectly or unintentionally that may be. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. Mary is not praising God simply as her personal Savior, her personal genie who does great things for her. God, this God is a God who shares His salvation, His mercy, His love, generation to generation for everyone, everyone who fears Him. Past, present, and future. So this is not just a song about now. It's not just a song about Mary. It's not just a song about her and her individual relationship with this God. It's a song about who God is. It's a song about this is something bigger and larger and greater than herself. It's not just about her. It's not just about me. It's not just about you. It never is. Because our God is so much greater than that. 
And this is actually the pivot. This is the turning point in the hymn. This is where the Magnificat turns into something else. This is where we get to the top of the roller coaster. And a lot of us, when we get to the top and we start to look over, we look over and, nope, we're not going there. We want to back out. And in fact, this is where a lot of the musical settings of the Magnificat take an exit, <laughs> a soft exit out to the side. Because the next part of the Magnificat is something a little harder for us to hear. This drop, that this initial hymn of praise takes us to. But if we embrace the Magnificat and we embrace the worship of this God whom Mary is singing to and singing about, this is where we need to understand and realize this is where that takes us. It takes us beyond ourselves. It takes us beyond what benefits us. It takes us beyond what makes us comfortable. It takes us beyond what is in line with our desires and aspirations. It takes us beyond what is right and good for us to considering and praying and thinking about simply what is right and good. And what is right and good writ large may very well invite us, perhaps even require of us, a sacrifice. Remember that posture of humility and service that we just sang about. This is what it leads us to. God has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and filled up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Now remember, this is a song of praise. Be honest. When you hear Mary sing that the thoughts of the proud will be scattered, do you rejoice? When you hear Mary sing the rich will be sent away empty and the poor filled with good things, do you rejoice? When you hear Mary sing that the mighty will be pulled down from their perches, do you rejoice? If not, what's holding you back? Do you rejoice that God is faithful to God's promises? And one of those promises is that God is going to set things straight and set things right. If we don't rejoice in that, if we can't bring ourselves quite yet to rejoice in that, then we need to especially sit with and wrestle with and allow these prophetic words of Mary to wrestle with us. Because this is where our worship, this is where the gospel, this is where the calling of Jesus leads us and takes us. And I would submit that if we are hesitant or reluctant, and I can't honestly stand here before you today and say that I would sing this song and completely fully rejoice... If we are hesitant, if we are reluctant, I would submit to you it's because we are reluctant to give ourselves as fully to God and God's purposes as God calls us to, as we like to think that we have. We're not quite yet thinking with the same mind that was in Christ. We are not yet quite thinking with the same mind that was in Mary when Gabriel came to visit her all those centuries ago. What Mary is singing about here in the second half of the Magnificat is the structural, systemic, and systematic realization of the humility, the devotion, the obedience, the surrender that comes when we take on the mind of Christ, that comes with worshiping God solely and completely. She is singing about what it socially and politically looks like for every valley to be exalted, 
for every mountain and hill to be made low, for the crooked to be made straight, and the rough places to be made plain. We sing those words at Christmas time all every year, don't we? This is what that means socially and politically. And I know it sounds violent, it sounds forced, and in the final reckoning, it may be. It may be for many. Because ever since Eden, we have all wanted to make things about us rather than about God. But it needn't be, and it shouldn't be, for us in the church. Because as the body of Christ, as the people of Jesus, as disciples following in the footsteps of Mary, we are called to preview for the world what the coming of God's kingdom looks like in how we live life together both inside these walls and outside these walls. What Mary sings about is precisely what we see when we pause to think about the lives of those who have come before us who, like Mary, have modeled faith for us. And I'm not just talking about the larger-than-life saints that are household names that we can all talk about a little bit. I'm talking about all the people that we know who've been examples for us. Think about some of those folks whom you view as saintly and how they live, how they give. The saints that we remember are saints in part because... They willingly come down from their thrones and open up themselves and their coffers to other people. They come down from their perches and they open themselves and their coffers up to God and they do so for the glory and worship of God. We could start with someone like Francis of Assisi, someone who came from a very wealthy family and who walked away from it all. Naked, in fact, if the stories are to be believed. I don't want any of it. I'm giving myself fully to God. And we're still talking about him 800 years later. Might think of someone like Basil the Great, a prominent theologian of the early church from a very prominent and wealthy family, and besides his writing, besides the liturgy that he left to the church, he also left a center in Caesarea where he was bishop that was a model for working with and caring for the poor in his day and age that far outlived him. It was part shelter and part hospice and part hospital. People came from all around, not just to receive care there, but to think about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. One of the people that you would never have heard of, but that came to mind as I was thinking through this list was someone from the church that I grew up named Henry Stokes. Came from a very prominent family. In fact, if I remember his family tree correctly, there's a county in North Carolina named for his people. But when he felt called into the ministry, he gave away much of his inheritance to follow this calling that God had placed upon his heart and upon his life. He could have followed a very different path. But for him, that was part of what it meant to be faithful, and I convinced that because he was willing to give himself that fully to God that was part of how he and why he became the person that I and many people who were part of that church remember him for he was someone who embodied what it means to have the peace that passes all understanding just talking to him in the hallway at church you could feel your blood pressure just leveling out <laughs> He just brought this peace with him. It was the kind of person that he was, that God shaped him to be. And of course, as Canadians 
we'd be remiss without thinking about Jean Vanier. I mean, it's a name that I had heard about, heard about his legacy long before I came here. I've learned so much about him since the news of his death. I had no idea he came from such a prominent family that his father was a diplomat, at one time the governor general of this country. (laughs) And I stopped to think about the life he could have had. I mean, a life coming from a family like that, he had every connection that one could hope for. He could have taken his life in any direction he wanted. But he gave his life to God. And he gave his life to those whom we would refer to as disabled. And he gave his life to them because he didn't see them as burdens, he saw them as teachers. In other words, he saw them as human beings created in the image of God, as people who were fully human, who were worth the same sort of care and devotion that any of us would want, that any of us deserve. He devoted his life to them. And all of these people and anybody else we could add to this list this morning They blessed others by opening themselves up in the way that they did, by giving themselves over fully to the worship of God, to the discipleship of following Jesus the way that they did. And they blessed others, and in turn, they were blessed. All of them lived rich, fulfilling lives, despite everything that they gave away that they were willing to let go of. And so I think that's part of what the Magnificat reminds us of, calls us to see when we allow these words to really confront us, when we really wrestle with them. I think it shows us that the Magnificat really, what it begins is a cycle That when we fully worship God the way that Mary worships God, when we fully bless God the way that Mary blesses God, when we celebrate the great things that God has done for us and allows our worship and praise and devotion to God to take us not only to the top, but over the side and down that roller coaster to giving ourselves away, to wanting what's good for others, to coming down off of our own perches. God will not only bless others through us, God blesses us through those whom we open ourselves up to. Which brings us back to praising and worshiping God for the great things that God has done, which takes us back around the roller coaster again and again and again. So I want to challenge you today and this week and the weeks ahead to really sit with these words, to let God, the Holy Spirit, push you and challenge you in your relationship with God and how willing, how far you're really willing to go. And this is not just a process that takes a few hours or a few days. This is a lifelong journey that we begin. And I want, us, I want to invite all of us to begin thinking more deeply and intentionally as we begin preparing for our service day on May the 26th. I want to challenge you and invite you to give radically and generously to the things that we are collecting, to give away, 
at the end of this month. To not just buy some canned goods with what you have left over. To not just give what's convenient for you to give. I want you to give thinking about the people to whom we will give these things. I want you to think about those people as those whom God sees as valleys to exalt. As those as people whom the Lord wants to fill with good things. Think about those people the way that Jean Vanier thought about the residents of L'Arche, the people for whom he founded L'Arche for, and give out of that conviction. And let's watch how the mountains of goods begin to pile up. And let's sit back and watch what God not only will do for them, but for us when we engage that kind of work. And as we go, as we begin engaging this kind of work, let's remember that Magnificat is more than just a song for Christmas. It's really a song of worship and discipleship for each and every season And let's start to remember Mary as more than the mother of Jesus. Let's remember her as a model disciple who shows us what it means not just to sing and to worship, but to give ourselves fully over to God as an act of worship. As we remember and recall and allow the Holy Spirit to challenge us with what she sang. Thanks be to God for the journey to which God calls us and the gifts and blessings, not just for others, but for ourselves. Amen.